This past weekend, things got ugly at a college football game in Tennessee. After a call went in favor of the visiting team, effectively ending the game in their favor, fans in the stands erupted in boos and then debris. Water bottles and beer cans were hurled onto the field, forcing the cheerleaders and band to flee to the locker room and the players to move to the center of the field. The coach of the visiting team was actually hit with a golf ball. This is obviously sportsmanship at its worst, blind competition that loses sight of the fact that no matter how important the game might seem, it's still just a game. Don't go to war over this. Of course, and unfortunately, it's not an entirely uncommon sight either. We've seen this at stadiums before. We've seen it in our streets. We see it on Twitter. A mob mentality of people doing things that make no sense, just an overflowing of collective rage. And it's got me wondering lately, how does this happen? The fact that someone threw debris on the field is almost to be expected. There were 100,000 people at the game. Someone was probably drunk. There's at least one idiot there, right? In every situation, there's always someone who's willing to do something stupid or ridiculous or completely dangerous without considering the consequences. But that's a very small number of people. I'm guessing that the vast majority of people at that stadium would not have been the first to throw something on the field. Very few people are going to be the first rioters, the first to directly attack another person. To stand out on your own, not knowing if you're going to be left to face the consequences by yourself, very few people are like that. But when someone else has already taken the lead, when it seems that everyone is doing it, there reaches a tipping point in which it actually becomes harder not to do something stupid, when it takes immense leadership to go against the crowd. Call it peer pressure, call it cover from punishment, call it what it is, a mob mentality. What you get in these situations is fascinating. A lot of people doing something that they would have never done on their own. And that is my question. How do we get to that tipping point? How do we get from one idiot to hundreds? In thinking about this question this week, I was reminded of a long drive I was on recently. Some of you may know, but here in Georgia, there aren't always major freeways to get you where you need to go. You have to drive on side streets, single lane highways. On this occasion, I found myself trapped on one of those single lane roads behind a long line of cars, all going under the speed limit. There I sat, trapped, fifth, sixth in line, unable to pass, unable to get anywhere. You know the feeling. It's infuriating. Get out of my way. I found myself getting increasingly frustrated by the truck in front of us, holding up the whole line, blaming the situation on them. But then I began to realize something. While the first car was certainly the leader, the one initially causing the cars to slow down, it wasn't entirely that front car's fault. You're allowed to go under the speed limit, and that car going slow didn't preclude other cars from going faster around them. What did preclude other cars from going faster around them, the true source of the traffic jam, was actually the second car. It may sound strange, but it's true. Because the second car chose not to pass, just sat there behind the first car, the ability of the third car to pass was almost entirely diminished, by the fourth car, it was impossible. The first car clearly set the trend, was absolutely the leader in this situation, but had it not been for the second person, it wouldn't have had any effect. A leader is nothing without followers, and once you get just a few followers, it's hard not to follow. This, I think, is an often overlooked aspect of leadership, particularly when it comes to mass movements and mob mentality. It starts with the first followers. There will always be leaders, always people who go against the status quo, who do something different that ordinary people wouldn't do. If everyone ends up following them, they're given credit for starting a movement, good or bad, but if no one follows them, as is often the case, they're just a single crazy person. Going first doesn't make a movement. It's the second person who transforms that crazy loner into a creator of a movement. The first few people that do the same as the leader give legitimacy to what the leader has done and also cover for people who are a bit more reticent to jump in. Going first is heroic, second is terrifying, but by the time there's a small group, no one needs to feel like they're taking a risk or have much ownership in the outcome. Other people are leading. I'm just joining along. But here's the thing. As powerful as the first followers are, as important as they are in legitimizing a movement, they almost never consciously choose to start a movement or even realize that that's what they're doing. 
the first followers, the second person to throw a beer onto the field, the first to join the crazy person on the street, the first to retweet something false, can only see the small thing in front of them, the single event. They can't see what will come behind them, what they're actually enabling in others. And that is the fundamental problem with a mob mentality. Individuals see themselves as individuals, not as participants in a larger movement. They look at themselves and say, I just threw one bottle, I just threw one rock, I just sent one tweet. In itself, it's a drop in the ocean, having nearly no effect on the world, if it were just an individual act. But the reality is that our single individual actions legitimize the actions before us, making it easier for others behind us to do the same. As someone who has been the target of a few Twitter mobs, I can tell you that it's never any individual tweet that hurts or affects me. No one person is ever responsible, and taken in isolation, most tweets are fairly mild, easy enough just to brush away. The individual tweeter feels no remorse for their critical retweet or moderately hurtful comment because it's just one tweet. But when it's 500 comments, retweets, and messages, when it's not just a single bottle, but a stadium full of flying debris, something has fundamentally changed. The individual seems no more culpable. They've still only thrown one bottle, one tweet, but they now find themselves enabling others to do the same. They're a part of something bigger. They're not just acting alone. They're implicitly starting a movement in which you almost can't not participate, in which people completely separate from the conversation now feel a need to have an opinion about it because it's become such a big deal. Mobs begin not because of charismatic leaders alone, but when people fail to realize that they exist in a society, that their actions do have an effect on the whole. And once a mob gets started, there's really nothing to stop it. Once 100 people have thrown their bottle at the stadium, there's nothing any righteous person can do to stop them, nothing any authority can do to intervene. At that point, it's an avalanche running out of control. If you want to stop a mob, you have to stop it before it happens. If you want to minimize hatred on Twitter, you've got to ignore the hateful tweets. Pretend like you just don't see them. Don't take the time to call them stupid. Don't retweet them to point out their flaw. It may seem well-intentioned at first, but all you're going to do is give more attention to it, perpetuating outrage, and giving more people an opportunity to throw their water bottle too. If we want to stop mobs from happening, and we should want this, we must acknowledge the fact that little things add up, that even the little things we do can help fan the flames, building up a faceless mob and letting it live on. If we want to stop mobs from happening, we must recognize that there are no insignificant actions when living in society, no choices that exist in vacuums. Whatever we choose to do, in a stadium, in the streets, on the internet, maybe most important of all, in our faith, these things have effects on others. Mobs are begun by unsuspecting first followers that give cover to those that come after them. And so we must ask ourselves, what sort of cover am I giving? What movements are allowed to live on because of my actions? Everything we do is permission for someone else to follow after us and to do the same. We must take seriously where we are leading people.